The Minister has given notice to the Business Committee that he will be out of the country and not available for questions. The Minister of Health and Social Services and Public Safety will therefore respond to questions on his behalf today. I call Mr Pat Ramsey. Question on Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, I can advise the member that as of March 2014, housing associations had 3,901 bungalows in their stock. The Department for Social Development has been carrying out analytical work to identify whether the current level of stock is sufficient to meet need. This has identified two issues. The first centres on the need to make better use of the wheelchair standard accommodation already available, and the second is to reduce the time taken to provide new wheelchair standard stock where this is needed. Uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, work to address both these issues is well advanced. An accessible housing register is being developed to identify the type and location of all current adaptive and wheelchair accessible social housing. In addition, the Housing Executive is examining its allocation processes to ensure that best use is made of existing stock to meet need. In relation to new homes, the Department for Social Development and the Housing Executive are reviewing the specification, standards and processes for new wheelchair standard accommodation. Work is well advanced on this and a business case for changes to the approach is currently being prepared. Well, Mr. Ramsey for supplementary. Yeah, and I thank the Minister for his very detailed response and clearly it is a subject matter that is getting some traction within the Department. But, but given, Minister, that particularly in new build, the concerns from disabled people, from older people, from those groups representing them, I think it is time that the Department took affirmative action because of the most recent scheme in my own constituency, almost 130 houses that are not completed yet, we have just one bungalow. That does not fit in terms of meeting the needs of, of the community that I represent and the constituency I represent. And certainly could I, in, in the absence of Mervyn's story, maybe ask for a meeting with those representing disabled and older people to discuss the subject matter. Sure, thank, thank the, the member for I suppose I can commit the uh, minister to all sorts of things in his absence. It's his, <laughs> it's his, own, it's his own fault for, for not being here. Um, I'm sure the minister would be, uh, I'm sure, very interested in, in taking forward that in, invitation. I'm sure he would, uh, he, like me, probably has a very open door policy to these things and would be prepared to listen to anybody who brings any representations to them. I, I think, you, I think you, you're, you're right in terms of you identified yourself that at least there is, there is some work going on in the department on this. And this was a, what I bring to mind, I'm not responsible for this department. I, I understand some of the concerns that the member has expressed. Indeed, I'm sure other members around the chamber would express from their own experience and their own constituencies. And I think there is an identification that, well, not so much that there isn't sufficient capacity, but that part of the problem is that we don't know where the capacity currently is. And that's why the recommendation coming from the working group's uh, work a couple of years ago, which recommended putting the, working, uh, the accessible housing register in place, is a good thing to identify where sort of the specifically purpose-built bungalows might be, but also uh, accommodation which has been adapted. I think part of the problem, that, and certainly something I've experienced through constituency work, is that you see homes that have been adapted to disabled needs then being allocated to people who perhaps don't have disability needs. Uh, and that investment is, well, uh, that's not a, it's a good house for that person, it's not an appropriate house perhaps, and it's not the best use of the investment that has been made out of the public purse uh, in previous years. So mm -hmm. having that register in place will assist uh, the housing executive, assist this department in knowing where appropriate stock is, and then it will hopefully allow it to, to better uh, allocate housing and people to appropriate housing into the future. But there is also an awareness of the, the slowness of the process in, in, in perhaps bringing forward accommodation that is to meet specific needs within communities. And I think that's, that is all something that's very much under review by the department, something the department's taken quite seriously. Well, Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Could the Minister maybe outline um, how the new housing, sorry, the new social housing is being built to incorporate the needs of wheelchair users? Yeah, there, there are, I suppose, a couple of different ways in which um, accommodation will be being built to uh, meet the needs of wheelchair users. Um, the, the member will be familiar with, I'm sure, new, so particularly new build in his own constituency, that all new build social housing is now built to uh, lifetime homes standards. Uh, and that will obviously involve trying to remove barriers of accessibility, which are often present in, in dwellings. So, that will have a more flexible, a more adaptable uh, design and structure, which enables um, 
the housing to wrap around the needs of the person over a period of time. And that includes you know, having better access to the house, uh, better approaches to the, uh, the property, and better circulation and accessibility within the house. But there are also obviously particular cases which I touched on in response to Mr. Mr. Ramsey, where an individual applicant uh, will require a very particular wheelchair accessible home for their, their medical reason, for, for medical reasons. And that individual's existing home can't be adapted or a suitable alternative housing solution doesn't exist uh, through new, new build or existing accommodation. So in those circumstances, a new home is commissioned specifically for that individual, for that family on a, on a bespoke basis. Um, but unfortunately, that can lead to a delay of, of sometimes months or, or even years to get that person the permanent accommodation that is suitable for them. And I think the member would agree, and I'm sure the whole house would agree, that's not a satisfactory way of doing business. That's not something that we want to see uh, continue. And that's something that, again, the department uh, is working with the housing executive and others to develop and uh, improve processes that will meet that need in a much more speedy fashion so that people can get the, the permanent accommodation that they need. Thank you very much. Call Mr. Barry McElduff. But uh, I'll ask and call you uh, question number two. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I've been advised by the Housing Executive that as of June 2015, there were 1,330 applications on the waiting list in the West Hurlow and Parliamentary constituency, which of course includes the former Strabane district as well as the former Oma district. Of these, 498 applicants are deemed to be in housing stress. The 2014 to 2019 housing need assessment indicated that there is no requirement for the provision of new general need social housing in the Oma area. However, Apex Housing has, have, have plans to develop an eight-unit new build scheme in Woodside Avenue for young people leaving care, which is planned to start in late 2016. There are also two social housing schemes currently on site in the Oma area, a 16-unit Apex Housing Reimprovement Scheme for clients with learning disabilities, and that's at Railway Court, uh, which is sh uh, scheduled for completion in February of next year, and a single unit suitable for physically disabled person is being de delivered by Habenteg on former housing executive land at Lamy Crescent, and this is due for completion in March of next year. Mr. McElduff, for a supplementary. Thank you. Uh, can I thank the Minister for his answer? Um, I would say to the Minister that given the ageing population and a uh, greater number of people with mobility problems, uh, there is a greater need now for single-storey dwellings either from the housing executive or from housing associations. And can I ask the minister if, particularly in the OMA area, he can intervene with his colleague to ensure the greater availability of single-storey dwellings specifically uh, for people with mobility problems and for our ageing population? Thank you, Member, for, for his question, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, first of all, I'd like to note that it, it doesn't matter whether it appears to be social development questions or, or health questions or even finance questions in the past. The Member will always find a way to ask a specific question about the, the OMA area, um, and no difference in matter what question time it, it is. Um, I think the, the follows on somewhat from uh, Mr. Mr. Ramsey's question about single story accommodation. And I think what we are always looking for is to try to um, house people in, and find homes for people in, in suitable accommodation for them. That might be because of disability needs or um, having the foresight to, to, to look into, as I was talking to Mr. Douglas or responding to Mr. Douglas about around um, lifetime's home standards and the need to, to have the foresight to have a house that can be adapted to needs as they unfold over a person's lifetime. Uh, and he's right, he's hit on a, a particular challenge that we face, which is a challenge of, of an aging population. It is, it is very, very good news. Um, that we are all living longer, we're all living generally healthier and happier lives as well. Um, but there are many who live longer, but live longer with sometimes one, but maybe more than one chronic condition. That's something I know very well from, from my current ministerial responsibility. Uh, and that impacts not just on health, but it impacts on a whole range of public services. It impacts on, on housing quite clearly as well. And that's where, and, and given the fact that an increasing percentage of the population is single as well, um, is something that I know that the Minister is aware of. It's not something that the Housing Executive and the Department are aware of. And it is something that we have to do over time, obviously, in terms of making investments to uh, adapt our accommodation that we are providing through the social sector uh, to ensure that it, it meets all particular housing needs. And that's family needs, that's for, for couples, but also as well for singles uh, as well. So it's a, it's a huge challenge given where we're coming from in terms of the profile of the housing stock, but it's not a, it's not a challenge that we're not aware of and that's something that we're not trying to address. Call Mr. Joe Byrne. Mr. Deputy Speaker, 
I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can the Minister state if those people in private rented accommodation are included in the assessment of the social housing need? Because there are many families who are in private uh, rented accommodation, but they have no security of tenure, and this is a constant worry and problem for them. And very often they do have to face increased rates without due consideration to their circumstances. I don't know for the OMA or the wider West Rowan area how many of those who are on the, the waiting list, or particularly in, in housing stress, are those who are in private rented accommodation. And I'm not even sure whether those figures are, are able to be provided by the department. I'm sure if they are accessible, that we would provide them to you. Um, and and I, accept the, I accept the point absolutely, and, and, and the, um, the housing waiting list will include people who are in private rented accommodation. It will also include people who are owner-occupiers. Um, so there will be a range of tenancy types will be contained within those numbers. And, uh, and, I, and I'm sure the Minister as well would also accept that there are, it doesn't matter whether people are in, currently in social rented accommodation, whether they're in private rented accommodation, whether they're owner-occupiers. There will be a housing need right across all of those sectors, and that will be reflected in the numbers that are before us, whether that's in OMA, Western OMA as a whole, or right across Northern Ireland. Mr. Anderson. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Minister, can I ask uh, how land is identified for the development of social housing so that it ensures that social housing is supplied where it is most in need? The member will ensure from, from his own work in his own constituency that, that in the last number of years, um, perhaps easing in more recent times, it has been, been quite difficult for housing associations to identify appropriate land in their constituencies. Um, during the, the, the so the, the property bubble times back in the um, back about five six years ago, um, there was um, great difficulty for housing executive or for housing association. They were often out bid when they were going for, for sites, and it pushed them into perhaps uh, much smaller, maybe more difficult to develop sites, sites where they weren't um, able to build just as many numbers of, of new builds as, as perhaps an area particularly needed. But this, the process hasn't particularly changed over that time, as far as I understand. And areas where, where a housing need is identified, and obviously on an annual basis at a district level, the housing executive undertaken a needs assessment, and that's what produced the figures that I, I read out to, to Mr. Michael Duff in respect of the West, her own constituency. But, that work is done, the need is identified, and then housing associations are, are encouraged to look for land within that district to um, find potential sites for, for development. So in that sense, the process hasn't changed. A housing association then identifies a site and, and, and will register that site on the social or in the housing executive social housing development program and with the group uh, within the housing executive. And then that goes through a process of due diligence. And at the end of that, uh, subject as opposed to funding, both from the public sector and also the availability of funds to the housing association, that land will be developed in due course. So the process hasn't, I don't think, fundamentally changed. There have probably been some tweaks and changes down through the years, but it is still there. And I hope that, given that the, the market has somewhat eased in, in more recent times, it's not as bad as it was, that we'll start to see um, more housing uh, associations develop across Northern Ireland, or the, uh, freeing up of the availability of, availability of land. And of course, the public sector getting rid of some land as well. I've seen this in my own constituency as well, where um, unrequired, unneeded public sector land has been developed by housing associations, and I think that's a, that's a good thing. Call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, the Minister has not had any discussions, nor have senior officials, officials had any discussions with other political parties on welfare reform since June 2015. In June, a meeting was held in the Hilton Hotel Belfast with uh, executive parties to brief them on the progress of universal credit payment flexibilities, social sector size criteria, supplementary payment scheme, and disability protection scheme. The meeting was to ensure that there was a full understanding amongst political parties on how the schemes were developing and to provide parties with an opportunity to engage further on all elements of the schemes. Following the meetings, the papers on the remaining schemes agreed at Stormont Castle were issued to all political parties to consider. Since then, there has only been one inquiry from one political party. Mr Nesbitt for supplementary. Uh, I thank the, man, uh, the Minister for the, for the answer. I think the last real engagement, as he said, was in June, 10th of June in the Belfast City Centre, 13 weeks ago. Or to put it another way, £27 million of penalties ago. As we prepare to go into further talks, can the Minister assure that this time, unlike Stormont House, there will be no twin track, that all five parties 
will be involved and there will be no side deals or side discussions such as at Belfast City Airport. Um, we're all looking, um, I was going to say looking forward to the talks process, uh, that's probably absolutely the wrong way to describe it. Uh, we are uh, imminently entering into a talks process which is to resolve a, a range of issues. Um, and I'm looking forward, I think we are looking forward, I think this is the right term for this, we are looking forward to uh, the member himself coming forward with his cunning plan to resolve the issue of welfare reform, an issue which uh, I thought he believed had been resolved at, at Stormont House. Um, of course, we are all, all remind, mindful of the fact that um, welfare reform is a policy which he and his party supported in 2010. Uh, he ran on a manifesto which was to introduce the form of welfare reform which is happening in Great Britain right now. Um, he criticises the time that there has been since discussions um, with the Minister for Social Development. As I pointed out in my response, um, yes, there were discussions back in June. The Minister for Social Development provided papers to all of the executive parties, or were executive parties at that time, um, and provided those papers to those parties in June. Uh, and, and I would have assumed that once the Minister has pre presented parties with papers, that the ball is very much in the court of the other parties then to come back with any queries that there might be, um, any questions that they have, any suggestions that they might have for, for improvement. And since June, since those 13 weeks, as the member helpfully points out, uh, only one party has come back with any queries, with any suggestions, with any solutions, whatever it might be. And funnily enough, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, it's not the member's party. In those 13 weeks, not a single inquiry, not a single question, nothing has come back from the member's party, yet he seeks to criticise the minister. I call Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, there's certainly been some commentary, Minister, um, in, in the media that suggests that, that we're some way towards an agreement in welfare, given the public interest and in the interest of transparency. Um, can the minister shed some light on what that agreement might look like? The, the, I think we all listened with, with interest to what the Secretary of State said in her, her speech in I think it was Cambridge on, on Saturday evening, and she just made a statement in the, the House of Commons in the last few hours, and, and, and she's obviously indicated as a, as a last resort, I think is to, to, to paraphrase her, uh, she is prepare, happy for the, the government or prepared that the government should step in and legislate for welfare reform, and I, I think we would, we would all welcome, we ought to welcome that, um, given the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Because sometimes which is what is forgotten, whilst uh, some may huff and puff about what the Secretary of State has said, um, we are facing, if we do not proceed with welfare reform quickly, either by a decision being taken by ourselves, and obviously Storm, Storm and Castle and Stormont House agreements will form the basis of that, and this is not about an enter into the talks process, not to renegotiate the detail of that, not, certainly not to renegotiate the, the size of the financial package associated with welfare reform. Um, but if there could be no agreement between the local parties, then we face a very real prospect that early in the next, in the early next year, in the next financial year, um, the sort of over 600,000 people in Northern Ireland who receive social security benefits, who receive tax credits, wouldn't actually be able to receive those because we don't have an IT system that's in place functioning and able to do that. And that, that, that doesn't take account of the, uh, the impact that not proceeding has on the executive's finances, the impact that it might have upon uh, jobs in the Social Security Agency, both here in Belfast and in the North West. So I'm glad that the Secretary of State has, has done what uh, came forward and, and brought the clarity that she has brought to this whole process. And we enter into the talks, and if there is um, um, cunning plans or other ideas or thoughts that might come forward, that's fine, they can come forward. But there has been that very clear indication from the Secretary of State that the government will legislate if no agreement can be reached between the parties, and, and I welcome that. Call Mr. Alex Atwood. Could the Minister be less coy and confirm that at least the SDLP have gone back to the Minister since the meetings in June and have sought to meet with the Minister in relation to, in relation to a number of matters? But could I ask the Minister, uh, given the scale of the July the 8th budget and its proposals on working tax credit, given that there are 160,000 people in Northern Ireland working tax credit, given that that brings an income into Northern Ireland every year of £1 billion, Given that those proposals are going to impact adversely upon many of his own constituents as well as constituents of every MLA, do you not accept that in order to deal with the welfare issue, the issue of working tax credits and its adverse impact 
on Northern Ireland given the Chancellor's uh, announcement in July that that has to be part of the negotiations that are meant to commence at five o'clock tonight. Yeah. I, I'm not sure whether I should seek to embarrass the member and his party or not, but the information that I have is, is that the member's party did not come back with any response. Um, to, uh, it wasn't the Green Party either, obviously, just to make that point clear. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure whether there have been other lines of communication, but certainly not officially back through the, the minister and the department. But look, on, on the issue of, on the issue of, of tax credits, um, you know, I don't think anybody would, would um, demur from the, the analysis that the member has made in terms of the impact that the changes that the Chancellor announced in July will have upon particularly the society in Northern Ireland. Um, similarly to the impact that's been had from, from welfare, or would be from welfare reform, if it was that sort of unadulterated version that is there in, in Great Britain, and not with tweaks and changes and flexibilities that uh, would be adapted for Northern Ireland. Um, but the point that my, my friend and colleague makes from a sedentary reposition is a relevant one in this debate, which is that um, there has been, there, the Secretary of State has made it clear, and the government has made it clear that there is no more money, uh, and that then would put it on the, the uh, on this executive with the finite resources and the, the resources that we have that are under uh, considerable pressure to find resources to do something to ameliorate something that isn't actually in our direct control and that being, being tax credits. Um, and and I, I can remember from um, the talks process before Christmas listening to his party colleague uh, Mark Durgan, the MP for, for FOI, um, about seeking to deal with the problems that we were facing with this package of welfare reform, but knowing and understanding that we couldn't do this forever and a day simply because we couldn't, couldn't afford it as an executive. So I think those points are, are worth bearing in mind. But that doesn't take away from the analysis that the member provides that the changes that the Chancellor has put, has put forward uh, in his budget in um, July will have a negative impact on people in Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Robin Swan. Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Housing Executive initiated an investigation into the Mill House Hostel in Ballymena once concerns were brought to their attention by the Simon community. An action plan to implement the recommendations from the investigation is currently being implemented by the Simon community. The Housing Executive has not suspended funding. However, it continues to monitor improvements to the service as agreed in the action plan. New intakes to the facility have been suspended. The department has more recently been made aware of further concerns at Mill House, including allegations which relate to criminal activity. Officials have passed those allegations to the PSNI. In addition, Principal Deputy Speaker, the department has referred the concerns to the Charity Commission for Northern Ireland in its regulatory role of registered charities in Northern Ireland. Uh, the department is liaising closely with the Charity Commission uh, as a result. Call Mr. Swan for supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his detailed answer. Concerns were raised over Mill House by some of the residents to me where there was quotes actually that the conditions inside it were third world, you wouldn't keep a dog in it, and that was where we were placing the most vulnerable in our society. And if it's right, the Minister or the Department has now called in the Charities Commission and look at the running of the practices that was going on in Mill House. Can I give us some clarification as to what will actually happen to the Simon community? Because there's a plan and application currently there for a new hostel in Ballymena. And what can he do to assuage the concerns of the residents of Ballymena? Mr. Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I'm not aware of the, the particular issue around a, an, an application for a new facility, and I'm, I'm sure the uh, department will come back to, to the member having raised that point in, in due course. Um, and look, I, I, this is an, an issue that I was aware of through, through press coverage, and so that. Um, two different, as I alluded to in my original answer, two different separate um, types of press coverage, I suppose. Um, and, and it is concerning, and that's why um, the department responded as it did and called for an investigation. Um, I think the initial um, story or that it was run in the local press was around what the member has said about the, the conditions and the uh, standard of accommodation. Um, and I think that has been, whilst that was rebutted and refuted by the Simon community. Um, there has been an action plan, as I said, put in place, um, which was aimed to address all of the outstanding issues that were raised as a result of that initial inquiry and the investigation that followed from that. So all of those remedial actions, which will include the, I think, the standard of, of, of accommodation, 
are to be dealt with by and completed by the 1st of November. And the Department will then further review this with the Housing Executive once all investigations have concluded to make sure that the action plan has been lived up to. So, but I, I, I agree, and I'm sure the, the Minister would similarly agree, that um, accommodation for vulnerable people, for homeless people in our society, should be at a, the highest possible standard, and people who are in that need of that care should be looked after appropriately by whether it's by the statutory sector or, in this case, by a charity who are doing that work on our behalf. Call Mr. Jim Ballister. Um, the department say they're aware of these disturbing allegations. What assurance is there that there will be no witch hunt against people who probably qualify as whistleblowers in respect of this establishment? Because there have certainly been some suggestions that they may not be receiving the protection they should. Mr. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, if, if that's the case, that's, that would be the sort of thing that would concern me. I'm sure it would concern the Minister similarly if that, that is the case, and I would encourage the member, if he has any information around that, to pass that on to the Minister for Social Development, and, and I can assure him, if I can, that that will be appropriately, appropriately dealt with. Because it is important, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, accommodation of this nature or whatever it is that is being operated by the Department for Social Development, my department, whatever department it might be, if there are people who think that the, the standard is not appropriate, that there is uh, illegal or unlawful behaviour or criminality or whatever might be going on, that should be reported through the proper ways. And, and I would encourage anybody uh, to do that. And certainly if the member wishes to pass on any information that he has or has been passed to him, I'd encourage him to do that. Call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Given the further quite serious allegations that uh, the Minister alluded to, um, can the Minister outline what options would be open to the Department uh, post the November timeline that he has indicated looking forward to 2016? Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, the members are, these are, they are incredibly serious uh, allegations. They are being properly investigated, just as the original um, allegations were investigated thoroughly and an action plan put in place. It, it, it's too early, obviously, given the investigation that's been going on and information obviously passed to the police. Uh, it's, an, I think, an important and relevant point for us to, to jump to any conclusion about possible outcomes. But um, irrespective of, of, of what goes on and what is found in the investigation, the options that are I suppose, available to the Department, which I can address, are that I suppose, in general terms, the housing executive has a range of options which um, they can put in place if a provider of supporting people uh, accommodations such as this uh, are, are um, in breach of their contractual obligations. And that can range from uh, amending the terms of the contract to suspending the services through the contract or even terminating that contract. Um, and, and obviously, you would, as you would expect, you would, the, the Minister will take appropriate actions on the basis of the conclusions that are brought forward, notwithstanding the fact that there is a need for this type of accommodation in, in the Ballymena area, just as there is in, in other parts of Northern Ireland as well. Well, Mrs. Sandra Overend. Question number five, please. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, salaries of the staff in the Northern Ireland Housing Executive are in line with the terms and conditions of the National Joint Council salary scheme used by local authorities. Well, Ms. Sandra Vran for her supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, thank the Minister for that scant detail. I understand the Northern Ireland Housing Executive have gone through their own voluntary early release scheme, uh, releasing 149 staff over the last six months at a cost of uh, over £5 million. Can the Minister um, explain why, with fewer social houses uh, and significant powers uh, due to be re uh, released uh, to local governments, um, that the number of high paid level nine staff has increased from 23 to 28 over the past two years, and level eight staff have almost doubled over the past two years, uh, both costing uh, over £1,200,000. Is the Minister simply replacing uh, lower level staff with high level management? I'm, I'm aware of, of, of some queries. I think, actually, I think Mr. Beggs was mentioning level eight staff uh, in the previous debate, just as I arrived into the chamber. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have, there has been an increase, the member is right, there has been an increase from 36 to 66 is the information I have from 2013 to 2015 in terms of level uh, eight staff. And the reasons which are um, given to me as to why that is the case is that firstly in 2013-14, um, the increase was principally, and that was an increase from 36 to 51, principally around a restructuring of the landlord services uh, section within uh, the housing executive two or three region structure, which was to better uh, reflect 
the uh, reform of um, public administration and the new council structures. And in order to properly uh, realign with the RPA, the stock and staffing size of the new area significantly increased, which led to the appointment of more level eight area managers. Um, in 2014-15, uh, the increases are principally related to restructuring within the Housing Executive's Corporate Services Division, which included a move to a HR business partnering model, the establishment of a corporate strategy and planning office, and a temporary transformation team, as well as a, a regrading exercise, which resulted from a, a request for job re-evaluation on the part of the Housing Executive's team of solicitors. So there are a range of reasons um, which um, the Minister would offer as to why the number of level eights have, have gone up um, and whether the member is satisfied or not with that, she can take it up with the, the Minister, I'm sure. If she hasn't taken it forward in this debate, or her colleagues have, I'm sure she can take it up in, in writing with the Minister. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move to topical questions, and I call Mrs Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Is the Minister aware of any inescapable pressures developing in the 2015-2016 DSD budget, no doubt much like his own? We talk for longer than the two minutes I have about the pressures in my own department, as a member will be well aware. I'm not aware of any particular pressures that the Minister for Social Development and his budget is facing, but I'm sure he is. If his, if his department is anything like mine, I'm, I'm, having been Minister in two departments now, I'm not sure if there are any other departments quite like the Department of Health, um, there will be a, a range of pressures that he will be facing and he will be having to make very difficult, difficult uh, judgment calls as to where to use the, the finite and limited resources that he has to, in, at his disposal. Ms Dobson, for supplement. Can I thank the Minister for his answer, but can the Minister provide an update on any indication the Department may have received from DFP, um, as you know you have experience of that one, about the potential for in your cuts to departmental budgets? I mean, obviously the, the um, Finance Minister, um, towards the end of the last session, um, when she was bringing forward her budget, pointed out the, the financial realities that we are facing as a result at that stage about not moving forward with uh, welfare reform. Uh, and her concerns, uh, as, as they were my concerns when I was finance minister and remain my concerns when, in, in my current position, was the, the, the failure and the, or the inability of us to move forward with a voluntary exit scheme. And obviously, there has been good news in that respect in the last number of days, where the Secretary of State has, uh, following from her, her, her speech at the British Irish Association, uh, has made it clear that she is willing to let that funding be released. And I think, um, I think the Finance Minister confirmed yesterday uh, that the first tranche will go ahead in terms of people exiting the service at the, at the end of this, this month. And that will relieve pressure uh, in the Department for Social Development. I know that the Department for Social Development was one of the departments that was seeking to exit the, the greatest number of staff, or one of the biggest numbers of staff within uh, civil service. Um, and if those no people couldn't have left at the end of September, that was going to put severe strain on the DSD budget in year, and I don't think the department would have been able to live within its, its budget in year, much as many other departments wouldn't have been able to live within their budget in year because we were relying, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, on those savings coming forward. So the ability to move forward in the VAS, which I, I very much welcome, um, won't solve all of the problems that all of the departments, including DSD, have in terms of their budget, but it will be uh, will have offered some, some relief um, to departments, but more importantly, it's given certainty to those staff who were waiting to, to exit, who had uh, notice um, given to them, uh, and they will now be able to, to exit the civil service, uh, and I'm sure that they will be greatly relieved that they've got that confirmed and don't have to sort of live in limbo anymore. Mr Mike Nesbitt. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. At the, at the risk of being accused of being parochial, uh, I wonder what the minister, how the Minister would assess the effectiveness of support given to voluntary and community sectors uh, by the Department of Social Development in the Strangford constituency, which we both have the honour uh, of serving. Well, I would never accuse, I'd never accuse anybody of raising issues in the Strangford constituency as being parochial by any means. Or I'm well used to Barry McElduff raising, I think, as everybody is in this House, and parochial wouldn't quite describe it. Um, I, I think that there, the, the Department has a obviously has a role and a remit and responsibility for the community and voluntary sector, um, which is, I suppose, underpinned by the concordat that has been in place for a great number of years. And uh, I think that there has been a, not always, you know, I, I think the role between the community and voluntary sector and the department or the executive as a whole will always be one of um, assistance and also of challenge. 
Um, so in that respect, I think it is a healthy relationship that has existed, and certainly um, I know that from a current posting that there is a good, healthy relationship between uh, my department and the community and voluntary sector, one where we are more than able to work together to resolve issues and problems as they arise, um, and hopefully in a, in a mutually beneficial way. Uh, and in the particular Stanford area, a member and I know it, it well, and uh, you know I think that there are we are we are very fortunate in our constituency to have quite a, a, a large number of very very good uh, community organisations who are supported uh, by a range of different um, networking organisations who provide good support uh, and capacity and continued development and training within the constituency. And um, his mailbag, his emails, his telephone will be. Um, contacted by the same sort of people as I'm sure I'm contacted by with, so it's not perfect by any means, but and certainly I think we have, uh, from experience, a very good relationship between the statutory sector, on the whole, a good relationship between the statutory sector and community and voluntary organisations in the Strangford constituency. And as for a supplementary. I'm sure the Minister is aware of uh, the difficulties with 12-month funding, which lead too often to uh, an annual hiatus uh, in terms of service delivery and, and staff retention. And on that basis, would he join with me uh, in welcoming uh, and endorsing the, the recommendation in the newly published Heenan Anderson Commission that says where community groups are seen to be delivering positive outcomes, where they are delivering, uh, they should receive a minimum of three-year funding agreements. This is, this is one of those conundrums where, you know, I, I, yes, I, I can see it in my department. I'm sure that the Department for Social Development would have the same issues. I can recall it very clearly from my time in DFP. It is one of those things where it is, it is obviously the right thing to do, Principal Deputy Speaker, to give. And it doesn't matter whether it's a community and voluntary sector, it can be within the statutory sector as well. If you're trying to have long term sustainable impacts on social problems or on health problems or whatever it might be, having security of funding over a long period of time is evidently the best, self evidently the best way to go about it. Quite difficult to deliver in the public financial system that we have in this part of the world. Um, it throws up particular challenges in years like the year that we are in, not, not just because this year is one where we are, are challenged in terms of the resources available to us, but one where it is a one-year budget and there isn't the certainty for departments to be able to say, and particularly in an environment where we're expecting further cuts to uh, resource expenditure in particular in, in the years to come, very, very hard for departments to give that degree of certainty to um, community and voluntary organisations, or indeed any organisations, even some departments and some units within their own departments about the future expenditure, and, and that doesn't always then produce the best outcomes. It doesn't allow you, with any degree of certainty, to tackle those long-standing long ingrained problems that there can be within our society. So I accept the point that's, that's raised. I haven't seen the, uh, the newly uh, published report, although I was aware it was being published today. I haven't seen that recommendation or indeed any of the recommendations. It is a, it is a sensible um, proposal to put forward. A um, little bit more difficult to execute in reality, in my experience. Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, does the Minister agree that following the Secretary of State's uh, speech on Saturday relating to welfare reform, that Northern Ireland is now really forced between accepting full throated uh, Tory welfare cuts or acting responsibly by making sure that we implement what was agreed at the Stormont House? Agreement. I, I agree entirely with what the, the member has said. I couldn't put it better myself. Um, he's absolutely right. We have, um, well, I was going to say we have, but I don't think that my party, I don't think that the member's party uh, has this choice to make. It is for others to make this choice. Um, we did agree a way forward um, on welfare reform at Stormont Castle, at Stormont House. Uh, that was being honoured, faithfully honoured, until uh, Sinn Féin and uh, Aidan and the better by the SDLP walked away from those commitments. In fact, well, to be fair, SDLP backed away from them much quicker than Sinn Féin did. Um, and, and we are now faced with that, that choice. Now, the Secretary of State has, had, has said what she has said. I think it is a game changer. I think it has unlocked um, the situation that has made perhaps the negotiations that we're entering into uh, not easy, but perhaps a little less difficult on this issue. Uh, and it is up to others to make that decision. Do they want um, welfare reform? as it is in Great Britain, and we're all hearing the, the various stories about how difficult it is in implementation, the pain that it is impacting on people, uh, or, or do we want our own version on, in Northern Ireland? We have the template in the Stormont House and in the Stormont Castle Agreement, and it is up to others to, to show some responsibility uh, and to show some maturity and to live up to the commitments that they made last year. McCarthy for supplementary. 
Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for his response and totally agree. But will he um, agree with me that uh, those people that have refused to sign up or to agree to the, what they did agree to at Stormont House will um, indeed affect all the most vulnerable? We hear so much about the most vulnerable in our society, that those will be the people most directly affected. And that if we don't, if we don't, uh, and things go as, as uh, we don't want them to go, that we will all end up being worse off and at the end of the, Tory, the new Tory government wrath and uh, make sure that we do accept the welfare reform? Yeah. Again, I agree with the member and his analysis. Um, and we are already seeing an impact on vulnerable people, let's not forget, in, in Northern Ireland as a result of the failure of, of Sinn Féin and the SDLP to, to show some maturity and to live up to the commitments that they made um, last Christmas. Um, the impact of, of their backing off on welfare reform and failing to let welfare reform legislation pass through this House is seen no more starkly than it is in the Department of Health, where um, that £9.5 million pounds that we are losing on a monthly basis could um, pay for a lot of hip operations, could pay for a lot of knee operations, could take a lot of people who have been waiting a very long time on waiting lists off those waiting lists and, and deal with people who are, to use the members, for very vulnerable people. Um, and, and I think that we now have the choice or some have the choice between living up to the or living up to their commitments, living up to their responsibilities, moving forward with welfare reform, trying to move forward with a form, a form of welfare reform, which is more suitable to the needs of the people of Northern Ireland. That's what we have. That's the, the, the opportunity that we have through devolution to be able to fashion welfare reform at a cost, yes, but to fashion welfare reform in a way that suits our citizens better. Uh, and that, that choice still is there for those who have up to now not shown any maturity or responsibility. That choice is there for them, and I hope that in the, the coming days that they grasp that opportunity and we move forward um, with sensible, um, good, sound welfare reform proposals um, that put the, help to put the executive's finances back on an even keel and allow us to make, move forward and make some progress. Ms. Carolyn McKeever. Deputy Speaker, um, the household below average report for Northern Ireland for 2013-14, uh, it was published at the beginning of September, contains a number of worrying statistics uh, for our population. According to the report, one fifth um, of the population are living in relative poverty. How will the Minister and his colleagues, um, who unfortunately aren't meeting, work to decrease this figure? I'm not aware of the. the Particular report that the report that the member references, although I'm happy to um, take a look at it, and I'm sure that the, um, the minister and the department will be aware of it and will have a, have a look at it. And uh, I, I'll ensure that they respond to you with um, specific comments around what the report and its recommendations and what the department is, is doing to deal with it. And look, you know, I think we, we all accept that there are issues, serious, significant issues with with poverty in, in Northern Ireland. There are country, our, our region has gone through uh, very difficult economic times in the last number of years, which will have only served to exacerbate uh, existing issues and problems that there has been around po poverty, and particularly child poverty. Uh, and that's why I, I have long supported and will continue to support um, not just the sort of range and package of, of, of support that the Minister's Department will put forward through social development or the Department of Health or other departments will put forward to support vulnerable people and people who are in need, uh, but also the policies being pursued by my, um, my colleague, the uh, Minister for the Economy, in trying to, to grow a, our economy in Northern Ireland and increase our competitiveness because you know, we may have many disagreements in this House about things like welfare reform and other issues, but I think we're all in agreement that the, the best way out of of poverty is to, to give someone a job and to get them back into the workforce and to encourage them to, to earn, earn money and make that contribution to society. And that's, a, that's the best answer to poverty, better answer than anything that the Minister for Social Development and his remit can do. Cabot for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, through media reports, uh, I have noted that uh, the DSD Minister has visited some food banks um, uh, and has taken a great interest in it. And in the same report, uh, it stated that a quarter of individuals living, living uh, in families where there is a disabled person living, um, uh, it's in relative poverty in the same report for 2013 and 14. And I wonder if the research that was carried out uh, by the department into the usage of food banks uh, contained any data um, about people with disabilities needing to use the food banks. And maybe just if you're, when you're reporting back to the minister on this, that maybe that could be included in his answer. 
Mr. Principal, Mr. Speaker, I'll make sure that that is done. And, and perhaps it, having mentioned um, food banks, I think it's probably worth worthwhile again putting on record. I remember a debate with Mr. Douglas, and he's just, he is still behind us, uh, and I brought forward to the House some, some years ago around praising that at that stage of very early work that had been done by food banks across Northern Ireland, and, and, and obviously, unfortunately, uh, that has, out of necessity, had to increase in, in recent times. Uh, and I think we, we should you know, always take a time to, to, to praise those who are, in many cases, volunteering um, in the work that they do, and, and to thank those people who have um, provided food banks with, with um, food and other um, materials so that they can give that to people who are in need across our province. Um, so I think it's, it's, it has been a, a good, uh, appropriate response from, from those within, particularly within the faith-based community, to problems that they are seeing within the communities that they, they live in. Uh, and it's worth, again, taking the time to praise the work that they do. Time is up. Before we uh, return to the debate on the housing executives, the point of order. Speaker. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, you are aware that this Assembly was prevented from asking questions from the Ulster Union as Minister for Regional Development today, and yet his party leader and three of his colleagues turned up to ask questions from the Minister for Social Development. Would you please investigate if this is an infringement of the rules of this House, which makes us the laughing stock of the Western world. I'll bring your remarks to the attention of the Speaker.